Hello everybody. Before we start, are there no Bulgarian speakers? That's not Bulgarian. Oh, okay. So we're gonna stick to English. Dribbling for the numbers because until now we don't know our own numbers in terms of traffic. <laughs> so this is the number per year. Yeah, right? this is the number per year. It's the total from all the blogs we run. Okay, let's get to it. This is Koyan Dimitrov. He's the, the head of the blog. He coordinates everything that happens. And I do a lot of content and all of the offsite optimization. Um, we work for a company called Fantastic services. Uh, we are based in Varna. How many of you are from Varna? How many of you have heard about fantastic services? Okay, interesting. Well, uh, we thought we are like one of the biggest companies in Varna that nobody has heard of because a lot of people don't actually know about fantastic services. And actually, this year is going to be our 10th year. We recently rebranded. Uh, but uh, what we do is uh, we actually operate on three different markets. Uh, we have uh, people in uh, UK, in US, and in, in Australia. And uh, what we do is home improvement, uh, domestic and commercial services for uh, UK households. Basically. Actually, we have, this is, these are all the websites in our brand family. We have a website for cleaning, for handyman stuff, like uh, repairs, electricians, plumbers, and all that jazz. Home repairs, we got a fantastic gardeners, everything about gardening, both domestic and uh, commercial. Of course, pest control and removals. And actually, our team leader for removals is over there, it's our person Griff. Um, and uh, these are, actually, we do have two more blogs yeah. that are our business to business um, acquisition websites. We're going to talk about them later on. So yeah, because all those services, they have to be performed by people. These are our uh, franchise partners. Uh, so um, each of them is specialized in a different service. And our job is to actually do the, all the marketing stuff. And uh, we also have a big sales team in Varna. So we are kind of handling all the operations. It's a franchise model. Yeah. And it, it's proved to work really good. All right, okay. but why we are really here? We want to talk to you about our blogs, uh, and because this is a WordPress event, and uh, we want to share with you a successful blog story, and maybe just inspire a little bit along the way. So what happened in the beginning? Actually, uh, we started around five years ago, and we didn't actually have any idea what to do with uh, WordPress stuff, or mainly posting on Google Plus or stuff like that. It was really... Uh, in the beginning, we really had no idea what to do. Uh, um, we had zero idea of keywater search and optimization. We just posted random content, and if something worked, we were happy about it. There was no strategy, barely any resources invested, contrary to now. Now, we actually uh, dig deep into a lot of things in the digital marketing, in the search world. Uh, we are um, uh, digging deep in semantics, in uh, natural language processing, in uh, keyword research, um, so all those topics in between as well. Yes, that's it. <laughs> Ranging from page level to the entire architecture of the blog. Um, all right, so we are going to tap a short summary of yeah. our timeline. Uh, in the beginning, as we told you, uh, the brand websites that you already saw uh, from the different services, they didn't even have a blog, so we decided to install. Uh, we built them, but as we told you, uh, so there was a problem with uh, so many different things that we were trying at the beginning. Uh, 
we actually then, uh, we were ma- the blogging part was something we did as a side gig and we were mainly focused at uh, the money pages and actually leads and yeah the service pages that kind of stuff but gradually we got the brand side so we had to start doing something on those sites okay let's get a blog so we got a blog here and there gradually again step by step because honestly nobody in the company believed in blogs so yeah strange. but uh, that was the the issue was that uh, when we were doing the blogs in the beginning we uh, didn't have the main strategy where we're going to get the traffic from so we were trying to actually write topics that maybe the people will be interesting like uh, doing some lists or doing something that could get viral or whatever so we, shortly we understood that this is not going to work so we had to uh, concentrate on something that is actually bringing people consistently every day. So main, our main thing was to switch to consistency and this is where the growth happened. So we actually targeted keywords that are always bringing uh, uh, new uh, users, new readers. Uh, this is called like evergreen content. And this is what helped us in the beginning to uh, really start growing. Well, to say in the beginning, as we mentioned, we just started with random content, and at one point we had a lot of content that wasn't performing at all, neither in search, neither in user engagement, or anything close to those. So when actually Kawa was assigned with managing this stuff, and he was like, let's just cut everything that doesn't work, so we trimmed pretty much all the bad content, and started again with the ACO mindset like let's actually target something and go after keywords um, schedule yeah we had a schedule but this was not because Small. we had some fancy kind of like uh, settings that uh, when we post a blog on the blog then it goes automatically to the social media no we just wanted to be consistent for us and for our team and uh, to know that uh, by this day and this day we're going to have a blog so that we won't get like uh, being consistent, so this was this was the main reason why. Just follow a simple schedule. Yeah, posting. And this is how the fantastic book was like at the, the beginning. I don't know how many years, six, five. In the beginning, it was just uh, the yeah, like five years ago. Um, doesn't didn't have much of an architecture in terms of categories. It was just posts. So the old screenshot, the next one is pretty close, but we actually have categories that we started to to structure the content and to, to go after pages that support on the pillar, pillar cluster model or business pages. Which, we're going to mention about this yeah, later. later on. And this is now, we're gonna go deeper actually why it's different and it's a big deal because it was a big deal to get it where it is right now. And actually, where is that? Yeah, that's the next level shit basically. So. Uh, uh, now what we do is actually we're trying to uh, write naturally for Google so that, and also for the user. So uh, we are trying to catch these little snippets which are usually is amazing. Is anybody who's not familiar with feature snippets? Not familiar. Not okay, familiar. so basically, okay. in fact, you can explain um, them. These are the top boxes that you're gonna see ever more often when asking simple questions to get a straight answer. And it's randomly pulled, uh, randomly, it's pulled from one of the below, so it's the position zero and it brings a lot of traffic and everybody wants it yeah so, so basically you can get this position in google if you optimize well your pages your book pages and then you can get another one depending from one to ten where you are actually ranking as well so you get actually two uh, positions which these is are great. constantly changing and new formats pop up they constantly test different uh, results for the feature snippet there's a lot of <laughs> tweaking on that just as normal. Uh, so this is why we started to get deep into natural language processing. Uh, this is a term that uh, you may also get familiar with when you Google it. It's basically how Google uh, reads um, things online and understands it and is trying to make sense of it and trying to make it a little bit more recognizable to humans. For so anybody peculiar, there's a tool. Google's natural language, language processing tool is yeah. free. You can just test how it works. It's going to show you in a simple sentence what it leads to what and how it actually does it. So the idea is that if you know the basics of how it works, it's way easier to go for feature snippets. If you actually find, we're not going to go deeper into this. Yeah, if, yeah. Uh, if you find us uh, on LinkedIn, you will see that we have uh, our presentation from the online advertising <coughs> conference 
oh. in Sofia from uh, October last year, yeah. where we talked in more details about this. Yeah. Kind of Right. Yeah, so basically what was um, next? Well, numbers started to rise, we saw traffic rising, keywords, some that we didn't even expect. Uh, some articles started to get a lot of hits. One recently hit like 100,000 just for one piece, which was big for guys that didn't have it as a target. And we started seeing results. Uh, so this is why we had to uh, see how we can improve, so we decided to increase the steam size and to also implement some feedback services as well, so we were using a lot of uh, uh, stuff like Google Analytics, which we're going to mention later, and Hotjar as well. Uh, Hotjar is a tool that is actually creating heat maps on the site, and you can see where the users are actually interacting. So it's Anybody is not familiar with the Hotjar or Yandex Metrica video? Um, long story short, you can see videos of your content, and it allowed us, for example, for our business-to-business -business content to see where people have difficulties in later on improvement, improve the content. And the good thing is that we actually start to get franchisees coming from informational content. People signing up as, signing up as our partners. So that works and it's totally worth it if you have the final goal you know, that you want to achieve something, work of this much effort. It's good to mention that we have a big team. How many? Already five people, yeah. Five people. I think the total is about 20 people that somehow, one way or the other, get yeah, work on the box, blogs. Blogs yeah. and informational content, top of the funnel stuff. Actually, we cover content that's all the way from <coughs> top of the funnel, almost to the bottom. The hottest we got like prices, information on how to start a business, how to buy a franchise. These questions may sound simple. But people actually have the intent behind those. So depending on what everybody's after, even though they sound simple, don't underestimate such traffic because if it satisfies a person, we're gonna get a new client or a new lead. We, right now we have, I think the blog is the biggest channel bringing traffic, bringing free traffic every day yeah. to our business. Okay, okay, so now we can go a little bit deeper into some of those aspects that we briefly already mentioned. Uh, one of the things that uh, we found uh, in the last couple of years was uh, this kind of structure that is kind of getting hot right now in the SEO digital marketing field. Is anybody? there anybody unfamiliar with the pillar cluster concept? It's okay, well, long story short, as image shows, if you have a page that's important and you surround it with subtopics or how you call it similar or wider topics or narrow more narrow topics. Google sees this as a cluster, seeing that the page in the center is important. So internal links matter coming from relevant pages. It yeah. actually works great. So for example if in the middle you have an article about uh, carpet cleaning tips. So this is kind of like a quite general article, and then you can have uh, different uh, subtopics which you can spread into different uh, other articles. You can For go example, away. blood from milk, from blood, from coffee, from yes. blood, from all that jazz. There are long tails for all those searches. Then all the different carpet cleaning methods. Yes, I have a question. Yeah. Can I push, uh, are those links uh, by directional, like uh, centerpiece? Links to yes, 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 they are bidirectional, and we are actually trying when we are linking from the subtopics, we are trying to link with the at least with the keyword we want to run the main one for, but we make it naturally, we don't try to spam it too much. So that was Most that's time. quite important. <laughs> Most of the time. Okay, so this is kind of like a visual representation of what a pure poster might look like. Uh, you, you already saw our brand, so you can uh, google them and you can see when you. Uh, Go around, you can see... Uh, Again, that's the team leader over there, responsible for that website. The peculiar thing about this example is, is that the entire structure is outside of the blog. I mean, it's not under the blog directory. Uh, it's a standalone part of the website. Each of these uh, insects you see cover is its, its own cluster full with various long tails. Everything is structured on search. I mean, there is no page or URL that doesn't go after solid keyword search. All right. Um, another thing is that uh, when we're talking about the poster and stuff like that, 
uh, we were thinking about how we can make the categories more valuable and uh, what we can do so that our categories is not just uh, there, like you know in WordPress you just have the categories, but what can you do more with those pages? Like, uh, they are even not pages if you think about them just when you take a, a just default a feed. WordPress. And they're just the classic yeah, a feed. They're just for navigation, right? But no, you can actually make them more valuable when you make the content uh, there, like uh, when you concentrate your tips, for example, like we have a walk for tips, as you already understood. So, uh, for example, when you have the gardening tips, uh, it's quite uh, useful that the category is kind of summarizing everything, it's like the pillar so for the gardening tips. The know how I want to share here is that this blog tag it became very really liquid, and we're trying to shift it to something called a library, or just to yeah. have the mindset it's not a blog that you just post off. And you can transform it in pages that make sense beside the regular category block, uh, which is back to the pillar cluster idea. Yeah, when you see a category of uh, in a simple WordPress site, then you you see all the blocks there. Like and then you have the uh, pagination down there, and it's it's kind of like very very simple. We try to make it more valuable. It works. Yes. Yeah. So these are basically our main categories. This is something uh, we launched lately after the redesign that took a while to go live. Uh, but it's, we're going to share a bit details on it. These are just our main categories to go after some of our main services. And uh, just a bit of advice. Uh, you may want to go with uh, the pure and clusters under the box. So like a blog post can also be a pure cluster. It depends on your niche. It depends on your uh, way of working. But you can also, uh, if you really know how you will structure your content, at, uh, at one point you can really take the leap and try to put the uh, informational content under the service pages. Which is something, the pages that work, uh, no, more like the topics, Yeah. content that works great from a standard blog post, we started to slowly migrate it under our service pages because um, <coughs> When you publish a piece of content, an example in our handyman niche, we're not sure if it's going to go under the plumber or electrician. Some, sometimes it doesn't really fit in one particular uh, subfolder, so it's okay to taste it first, and when you see what works, you can segment, cut, and restructure what goes where. Because we've been asked a lot, so are you doing silos? And the silo structure is when you put something under a folder and you stack it. Um, all right, another thing that we implemented to, to grow the block further was to implement CDM, uh, which is Content Delivery Network, which is actually a way that you deliver some me some of your media, like images, for example. Question, is there anybody unfamiliar with the CDM concept? When you oh, right. Okay, super. Perfect. Let's yeah. move on. It's good to mention that our, our blocks were really slow, technical and loading speed. Super slow. Uh, we were using shortcuts that you broke every here and there, and the loading time was more than I would wish to admit. This is why we wanted to upgrade as well, and uh, as Peter Nikol said in the morning, we have to upgrade to the latest versions, because otherwise we are going to be lost. Uh, so we upgraded to Gutenberg, and now we are exploring the uh, reusable box versions, which are going to help us with the structuring of uh, the blog posts. And it's, it's both about getting faster, because as we mentioned, we have a big team, and it's pretty hard to get consistent all over the board, and that's making it easy. Alright, another okay. thing that we implemented in the design is that uh, we tried to find, to make the content more findable, so we implemented search bars on the home page, like it's more prominent right now, and it's also on the category pages, and now we see some increases in the searches, so in the beginning there were like five or six per month, now there's much, much more. And it's good to mention that back then we didn't have a dedicated home page that we actually thought of usability. We didn't have that much traffic and now people are actually going to the home page because it's more usable and they're sort of educating and learning that it's there. So it's really fun to not see that. Um, what is this? This is the second section and this is the about the file. This is below. We just have our newest posts here and below them we got a call to action which is another whole world of uh, user, user experience. experience. And below are our pillars, that is because the way we structure the blog, we try to to keep, how to say it, 
to Joseph. I don't know if you anybody is not familiar with the power of internal links and how having a good structure can really push you on results. But these are the ones we want to juice up in terms of thematics. All these are targeting general keywords. Below each of these six main pillars, we have subcategories. Again, everything is based on search. But they are not yet indexed because we want to fill more content inside. But slowly, content links, we're going to get there. Uh, another, the yeah, another thing that we implemented is structured data, but uh, we didn't go that much into details yet. Uh, there's a lot of new things coming up from Google. I don't know if you have followed, but a couple of days ago, uh, the IEO Google conference ended, and they said that they are going to bring us a lot of new things about, uh, especially about uh, informational content in terms of structured data. So if nobody is familiar with structured data, it's, uh, for example, these little stars More that like you see. Who is familiar with structured data? Using it? Okay, 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 sorry. Oh, good. All right, so when you Google a website and when you see it, uh, uh, when you Google something uh, and then you have the results, and then sometimes you may see stars, for example. Stars ratings, yeah. price range. These are part of structured data. So these things that you see in the meta description, in the meta stuff, uh, in the Google page. So basically, we are going to explore in the future the how-to ones which are going to be released very soon from Google. So if you're working on a how-to blog or stuff like that, just uh, pay attention. We're bringing this how-to thing because we figured out it for us even though this sounds simple as how to how to tie your shoe, how to change a light bulb, there are actually a lot of people searching for that, and many of those can serve a business goal. And at least for now, it's pretty easy still to rank for such terms, and it's bringing a lot of traffic, as you see in the first number per year, and it's growing actually. Our graph is growing rapidly, and All right. it's worth of going after such queries. Just what I want to share. Um, another thing is tracking. We, we, we don't want to shoot in the dark anymore. We want to know how our users are interacting with the website. This is why we have a few custom metrics as well, but uh, we're also using the main things that almost everybody is using it nowadays, like Google Analytics and uh, Codejar as well. But the uh, back before we started to do with the Google Tag Manager tracking like specific events and triggers, we had a lot of analytics data that, that wasn't accurate and that's why we have a dedicated person who actually dug into the matter to figure out how what it works and get into that kind of thing so we can actually get these metrics which are... Uh, yeah, but we also think that uh, when a user is interacting with your website and if you're mainly uh, writing for help when you want the people to actually read and engage with your content and then uh, if they are not actually clicking on something, are they? Are we going to just call them a loss? Uh, not really, because they might have engaged in the content, but we really don't know if we're just looking at the simple Google uh, Analytics dashboard. Uh, it's just gonna, like, the bounce rate triggers uh, when the user is not, I mean, interacting with anything. In but terms the, of results, we this is, out yeah, some this, uh, corrections, uh, it didn't work, we saw it, yeah. some, we had like five, one head clicks. If you had known change positions, going back for seeing videos, then sometimes seeing general data, okay, the scroll dating uh, has risen. <coughs> uh, this is why we wanted to combine uh, the scroll depth and also the time on page. So if a person is uh, scrolling at least half, 50% of the page and is staying at least one minute on the page, we're going to call it a win because they, have, they might have engaged with the content actually better than people who didn't do that. So this is why we have this adjusted bounce rate. And pretty much 20%, 30% of our traffic is actually falling into this category, which is amazing. Um, and to put it in perspective, we see people from these pages going to our home page and about us. We have even a, a club page, for a membership page. It, it's rising. And we're tracking people that actually subscribe and buy our membership program. We see that happening, which is amazing from a guy who's searching what to use instead of a hammer, which I personally believe is, never believe is going to bring traffic and it's bringing a lot of traffic and people are going to becoming clients, which is wow. Um, you can say a few words oh. about this because we oh, the images. Yeah. Uh, in terms of, okay, okay, what we want to say here is that back then, a few years ago, we had 
never had any problems with using images. But to put it, just the, the one rare example is, we found out that there are people uploading images set to be free for use, free for use with CC0 license at big websites like Pixabay, Pixhere, Flickr, and later on it turns out uh, that those images are actually commercially licensed. We even had to kill one or few domains that had an image posted in a Google Plus account that was verified on behalf of a, a brand, and it was it was copyrighted, and we were under a lawsuit. So. I even had, I went to the Pixabay forum posting, hey guys, why are you doing this? This image was said to be free and I was banned. So it was one of the cases that we figure out that it's a scam. And if you're using images on a commercial, on a page with commercial intent, you can get a nasty email and you should really triple check images to do, even after we figure this out, we're supposed to check all images and a few times again, turn out that there were images that we thought were free to use and turn out they weren't. And now it's something we are really scared of because the numbers were big enough to, to matter and we are buying all this, just paying for licenses from now on. From but there. yeah, if you don't have the money to buy images because they can be expensive, we use uh, uh, different checks like T9 for example is going you know, to help you. Uh, T9 is a uh, also, yeah, Chrome extension. There's a Chrome extension from Yandex, Yandex Images, which search search is great. It's better than it find, finds images that the others don't. So, so, so. Um, okay, moving forward. So we mentioned images. So how we actually make this box? Just a few words to share our process. What we do is there's something we call KISS, keywords, intent, semantics, and SERPs. Uh, those are four aspects of research we undertake before we actually start to write or order a blog topic or whatever piece of content. Um, keyword research standard, we use tools, you find the keywords, you, you cluster those, they help you figure out what you should have in a post, what not, what fits, what's too broad, etc. Then when we have the keywords, we start to dig into SERPs to figure out intent. Um, we've had posts that we thought were targeting the topic, but Later on, we figured out that actually the information inside was not the intent that the real user has. And it took us a while to figure this out up to a level that we can constantly ship, be certain that the intent is okay. So semantics, uh, we're just gonna mention again that NLP, Natural Language Processing module. Google is just getting smarter and we are working in the English speaking markets where you can sense that like strong. Um, so, besides raw keywords, no exact match, we started to dig in synonym, synonyms related keywords, terms, etc., etc., just to, to make the semantics as rich as possible. Uh, and last, we constant, constantly check SERPs because there were a lot of updates in the last year, and we've seen SERPs just change totally. And if you want to, before you start to invest into a blog post or page, you really need to see what's working right now. There are tools that allow you to see history back in time, just so you know where you're investing and you're not shooting in the dark. And when we have all these, uh, we go down to a summary. Oh, that's something, okay, go forward, now back, come back for this. All right, that's okay. Yeah, that's it. So, okay, let's say we got the keywords, the intent, semantics, and SERP information. What do we do then? All right, so uh, we compile all of this in a content brief. But we do that because we, uh, we work with writers. So we work with copywriters, with professional copywriters who need the whole information uh, that uh, Mitko just said. Uh, so we compile it in a nice uh, Google document. You can use whatever you want if you're compiling your content briefs. So in a content brief, we usually uh, put the, uh, of course, the title of the topic, the that, yeah. deadlines, and like this kind of things that you have to uh, put, like the uh, number of uh, words that we need as well. But because also, not everybody can write. I yeah. mean, it, it takes a lot, of, a lot of writing, so you can, unless you're a natural, but if you want to get a page that works, I'll have five minutes then. Okay, okay. We're kind of... I mean, we, we went to a process that we're certain in every state that we're not wasting time, we're not waste, wasting resources, yeah. because it takes a lot of 
time to just to research one post can take two hours to get it to the brief before writing it, actually. So that was the content brief. Um, let's get back to the historical. Uh, yeah, when everything is uh, said and done and when the blog post is uh, published, we may go to another one as well. Uh, it happens daily, but usually we also uh, go back because if you cannot, uh, if you don't improve your older posts, you are bound to be hit by the competition, or uh, basically somebody else is going to come up, uh, or just Google is going to get smarter and they're going to say, okay, your content is not good enough anymore. So this is why we always. Uh, dedicate resources to research all the blog posts and to fix them. So we yeah, have a checklist. checklist. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> because many people are going to stay consistent and not everybody knows what's happening. For all the things mentioned so far, we have procedures written down so even if you come today at the company, you can really onboard really fast what, how and why happens. Uh, so how do we do that? We have the content management system as well. Uh, well, well, content management sheet. Uh, so we have this kind of uh, a master sheet where we keep everything. Uh, so we have the idea depository of future topics that we're going to have. We have our calendar uh, with topics that are upcoming or topics that we're going to edit in the future. Uh, we also keep track of our pure posters there and what we're missing and what we're not. And a content depository of all the blog posts that have already been published so we can uh, find them easy. Because the things stack up if you're going for big traffic, at one moment you have tens of tens of posts with keywords and trying you need to somehow keep everybody on the same page, which is what the thing we want to share with everybody, is that if you're going big, you have to have a clear idea what, how, and why it's happening. Because as we mentioned earlier, we had to cut like 90% of content that was paid for to be produced, and there's no point in that happening anymore. Yeah. So? Yeah, and finally, we have it all nicely tucked in this fantastic academy. This is a, this is an internal website for us, just to keep it easy for every employee that is already in the company or is changing the department or is just coming uh, and to work with us. So we have this really easy onboard, onboarding process. As We're I trying to perfect it, of course, but uh, we keep all the documents and checklists in one place. Because as I mentioned, if we have 20 people doing it, the same thing, and that's only for like informational content or SEO. And we have a bunch of other departments. And at one point, the company realized that we need to centralize information and know-how and guides and steps. And that's where the Fantastic Academy is a relatively new project, yeah. but it's already working. It's getting better, but it's proven to cut the path and information on onboarding, like who, what, where, why. Um, it may say it's simple, but it takes a lot of the communication from tens of people just get everybody on the same page. And once solved, a problem never occurs again. Let's say about keyword research or keywords or just how to get a procedure with service department. But we've we had this issue going back for, back, back for tens of times, wasting hours and hours. And now that's really saving us a lot of nerves, primary results. All right. And that's long story short, how we run the blog you know, without getting too deep. If anybody has any questions, you can, okay, <laughs> let's start. <laughs> okay, you are number two. Yeah. Uh, hello. 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 Um, can I ask why the blogging is uh, a subdomain? Not in a subdomain? Well, that's um, kind of like it. <laughs> uh, it Probably it wasn't our decision to make. Uh, we kind of get into this situation where we started to work on the books and they were already on subdomain. And uh, there was not uh, resources for that at the moment to kind of uh, bring it to make to it happen. Green. Yeah. Just then we have the, the green light. So so is it better to be in subdirector? Well, we've generally, seen, yes. Yeah, generally, yes. But uh, our most successful book is on a subdirectory. So it really depends. After some time, Google catches up if, if it's a big site. Yeah. Because honestly, our domain is really big and we're constantly pumping it up with link juice. If you're on a small domain, it's better to be on the subdirectory. Yeah. yeah, that's tasted. Before we got big, we saw those blocks under the subdirectory that were uh, working better than the subdomain. Mm -hmm. But for now, we're just we're stuck to this that make, makes it work with the internal links. So Google did catch up. If you can afford it, 
It can work. That's it. It works That's this right. way. You can target a uh, blog page and uh, the website page for the similar keywords. So you mm -hmm. can have two results. That, that has happened. Has happened. Um, and then it disappeared and it happened again. And at one point we had the first three results. Um, we put a lot of attention to the content we make and actually so far it's worked good for us because we had the top, like, top results. So it, I know what you mean in terms of problem, but for, for us it proven so to work good. Event, if your site is big, uh, is it better to be in subdomain or subdirectory? In all cases, it would be best to have it on subdirectory. And as mentioned earlier, we are slowly migrating content that's worked, let's say, in cleaning or in pest control, as we showed in the earlier example of the books. We are migrating it under pages, at the money pages, so it's in a silo. Thank you very much. And yes. Uh, so if we are trafficking for free, without using Google AdWords, are we vulnerable to Google Penguin? You know, the one that's decreasing links. Um, well, actually, uh, to be honest, uh, well, basically if you're doing a really good organic strategy, and if you're really good at keyword research and uh, content uh, production, you might not even need backlinks to run, because, uh, uh, well, you already know who, which our websites are, and you probably have access to different tools. And if you're gonna uh, check them out, you're gonna see that you're not gonna find a lot of links because uh, we are actually betting on the box. We are actually betting more on the content strategy. So even without a lot of backlinks, uh, and I'm talking about backlinks because Penguin is actually hitting spam uh, backlinks mostly. That's a really deep topic. Yeah. to links. There's a lot of ups and downs. But we wouldn't, uh, we didn't just not do backlinks because we were afraid of Penguin. We didn't do them because we saw that we don't actually need to allocate resources for that because we are managing to rank without backlinks on the big topics. Only proper keyword yeah. research. Yeah. Question? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah. Thanks a lot. Just a moment. Uh, how often do you write articles and how long are they in terms of uh, words? All right, that's it. Okay, so basically, uh, how often? Um, now, because we are like a team of five people uh, that are producing articles uh, regularly, we publish at least two per week. But uh, before, we had uh, experience with completely different kinds of schedules. We even post it once a month. Sometimes on, the, on some of the blogs that we have, we post it twice a month. Uh, we post it daily. And uh, what we saw is that when you're posting daily, we, you don't really have the time to go deep into the topic. So this was kind of like an issue for us. This is why we decided to post at least two times per week so that we have enough time to, to do it. But even when you're posting monthly and you're well, in some time, like when you build up at least a few topics, uh, then you can, uh, and if, again, if you're good at uh, content research, then you can allow yourself to post uh, not so often. So you can end up having one article. Yeah. Per week. And when it comes to the length, uh, it really depends on what the user is going to be satisfied from. We mentioned briefly the searches in there. So basically, uh, if a if I'm looking for, if I'm searching for something like how to tie a tie, I'm not going to write a 5,000 word article about how to tie a tie. But if I'm going to uh, write something about some medical issues or, or wiring something. an electrical cooker. Yeah, or wiring an electrical cooker, which happened, then we have to go in a little bit more detail. So it really depends on how much the user is going to be satisfied a from an article. The answer would be that we have an article that's really short and it's bringing thousands in traffic. And it really depends on the query, some, as he mentioned, you don't need 5,000 words to tie your shoe yeah. or see a result on football or something like that. It really depends. That's why we look at the SERPs and when we're doing research and when you look at the SERP and you browse all the results and you get familiar with the topic, you're going to figure out how much you need. It's not about a battle, I'm going to yeah. write more. Also depends on our own knowledge about the topic, so we also uh, we also draw knowledge from our own uh, departments, our own uh, experience. So if we know something that we have, we have to say for this kind of topic, we just want to say it. 
Yeah. Does that answer your question? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Does. Thanks. Okay. Uh, you're close. Yeah. Okay. Have you ever deleted uh, an old blog post in order to? What are you? Oh, yes. Okay. <laughs> okay. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Have you ever deleted an old blog post in order to clean up the walk? Yes. 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 Does sure. it affect the CEO at all, or it's? I mean, it's that's a really arguable question. They haven't been ranking before for anything. We didn't get any traffic from them for uh, the past year. We were looking at that how uh, how much traffic we were getting from those articles, and if we had link backlinks to those articles. So uh, sometimes when we have a lot of backlinks but we don't have traffic, we could uh, do three hundred one view redirects to something that is. Uh, Useful, uh, it but depends. I mean, yeah, it really depends. My but, size uh, can other say it doesn't matter. In all guys are like big guys in the industry, so in our case, it didn't matter at all. We actually got positive results from cutting the content, but we also had to replace it with something that is actually ranking. So uh, yeah, basically, we didn't have any problems, but we had to write more and better in order to get results. And Honestly, sometimes I just delete the post just to get the links. I, I gather some links to who carpet post and I want it because getting links for service pages is hard. And sometimes you just get what you need. So you can there's a Google space. You can both things can work. I mean, it really depends on what's at stake in a specific thing. One more thing: yeah. Are you for or against buying backlinks? That's more for you. Well, we don't need to buy. We've developed a methodology that gets, a, gets us a lot, a lot of good links without buying them. But the industry is blooming. There are bourses, um, and bourses, bourses. Auctions. Auctions, Auctions. Yeah. And there are markets. There are huge markets doing that. So if you can't or don't have the time to know how to build links, you can always buy, I guess. But and we don't do that. Budget. Thanks. We, we are rather invest in something that more white hat. Um, and, uh, All right, that was. Uh, <clears throat> so, can you go back briefly back to the cluster concept of the keywords? Uh, it's not necessary to be on the computer. Uh, you said when you focus, you want to raise one keyword. You write a lot of blog posts with related uh, content and singular keywords. And the, the answer to your question is uh, something they call the topical layer. I think that it was officially announced in September. And if you read what the topical layer is, it's like many dots that Google is connecting in, in its AI, figuring out which dot relates to which dot. And the idea is that if you have one general topic that's really general, let's say, pick something. Um, Instagram marketing. And the idea is that you're not going to write everything you know in a single article, absolutely everything, because nobody's going to read it. And you just cut it into different pieces that the Google spider is going to see, imagine it as a web. So the mother piece is being supported or being pointed from with internal links, yes. Mm -hmm. For example, you can, when uh, with the topic of Instagram marketing, you can go down to uh, uh, tips to take Instagram pictures, uh, five tips to take Instagram pictures, for example, or some other mm -hmm. topics. Right? Yes. You can go, you can go deeper into uh, the separate. The concept is the same as the silo structure, but with internal links. You don't need the silo. Pretty much the same as the silo when yeah. you have the mother topic in those global, because we are not always sure. If we should build such a URL structure, we just go flat, see what works, rely on internal links, and when we get the results, we just either migrate or redirect or blend, merge, cut content in half. There's already a lot of resources on the web about keyword clusters. You can also see them as hub spoke. This is another uh, term. Fancy. So, you, yeah, fancy term. Yeah, you can uh, you can Google for more information, and you can see for yourself if that's actually going to work for you. Because it's not a one size fits all model. Uh, of course, so uh, you just have to figure out for yourself if that's going to be useful for you. For us, it proved useful. Does it answer the question? <laughs> uh, I believe you mentioned that uh, because of copyright issues, you have to kill one or two domains. Yes. Yeah. 
did they ask you to do that, or couldn't you just delete those pages? Uh, the decision came, I think, from our legal. Uh, the thing was that uh, when it comes to copyright issues about images, they have your history, so they seen that you you've already been using it for quite a while, and they're going to say, no matter that you have deleted it, you still have to pay us. So, it, because we're a big company with momentum, we cannot escape. I guess if you're a smaller website, you could just could kill the project and vanish. But we couldn't really escape from the situation. I mean, they, they had us. And the decision we got from our legal department was that I think they had some negotiation or something like that. Yeah. And the result was just let's kill it. We wait for some time and then redirected it, which you can do. So we, we can pay the value of the domain, but uh, yeah, still we had to sacrifice it for the greater good. I still miss that domain, to be honest. But thanks. <laughs> Anybody else? No? Okay. Well, thank you for your time.